Okay, are we, are we ready to go? Are we ready? Okay, so two things I'd like to do today. Um, number one, I'd like to review the quiz from last time because I think I just handed it to you quickly and then I sent you out the door. So I would like to review it quickly. I would like to, what's that? Nothing, we're okay. Um, I would like to finish talking about our worst mistake of the human race. Although now that Russia has invaded Ukraine, now there's two worst mistakes. Oh, no. I don't know. Has anybody, everyone's been watching the news? Yeah? What, what do you guys think? It's World War III? Are we all, hello? Are we all doomed? This is, this is it? This is the end? What's that? There's no point in living. Why? That still means we've got a, we've got another thirty years. Yeah, that means until I've got until I'm eighty-five. So, no, that's not. No, seventy-five. <laughs> seventy-five. That's a little early, but still. No, I'm sure we'll make it past then, won't we? We'll make it past 2050, won't we? How long do you think you're going to live or like the target? How long? Yeah. Uh, well, what age do you want to die? My, my, fiance, my fiance has promised, has made me promise that I'm going to give her 50 years. So I've at least got to live to 95. <laughs> we have a fiance now. Congrats. I do. Thank you. Was this recent? Uh, I proposed to her at the end of October. How did you propose? How did I propose? I, she, she wanted to do, she wanted to do like a, like a couple's photo shoot because we didn't really have any good pictures of her. Not like, you know, lots of selfies and things, but those aren't nice pictures. So she found a photographer that was trying to um, build up her portfolio. She was a new, new photographer. So we arranged to meet her at Queen Elizabeth Park, and she was going to take a bunch of pictures of us. And so I messaged her, I messaged the photographer the night before and said, by the way, I'm, I'm going to propose during this photo shoot. So I was like, just be ready for that. And so, yeah, and so she, she was ready, and I proposed, and so we got lots of good photos from it because there was a photographer right there. And she was very surprised, and... She said she, she had the right answer, which was also good, right? You don't, want, you don't want no, you don't want maybe, you don't want, can I think about it for a while? You don't want that. So the, it was the right answer. So yeah, it was, it was good. Yeah, that's, that's what you want, eh? Can I sleep on that? I don't know. Can you give me four to six months? I just want to see you if... Know, like three to five business maybe, days? Maybe, I'll, maybe, I'll give back to you. Yeah, maybe someone better will come along. <laughs> anyway, so yes, it's reasonably recent, but... Yeah, I remember before, you were like, you were still single. I was single. Yeah. Not anymore. So, so you were single, and then you're now you're engaged? Yep. How did you find a girlfriend? How did I find one? You know... Uh, <laughs> the tone of your voice is very important when you ask when you ask that question and 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 Rocio did a good job because you don't want to put too much emphasis on the you right you don't want to say how did you find a girlfriend <laughs> actually um the my boss across the street Sarah oh is it Sarah's friend it's it's the, one of the best friends of Sarah's older sister. So Sarah's got a sister who is um, two or three years older than her. And so my fiance is one of Sarah's sister's best friends. And so, yeah, she, she knew about me, she knew about her, and she um, connected us. Uh, we, had our, we had our first we had our first date on FaceTime. Oh, COVID. Yeah. On YouTube? Yeah, well, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> we didn't live stream it. Can you imagine? Like, as if a first date isn't hard enough, but you're going to, like, 
live stream it and people are like you know people are yeah people are like you know making comments <laughs> people are making she did after she, no once she knew what my name was she like cyber stalked me and yeah she tried to figure out who I was so um, but yeah that's that's how that happened so that's yeah that's been going well obviously yeah probably Probably. probably will. No, you probably will get proposed to. I mean, well, I don't know. That's someone I want. Mm. Does that mean, like, if I get proposed to and then send somebody I don't want? That's right. That's right. I might get you, married to them and then divorce them. Get my alimony. Well, you may, you, may, you, may, you may have to say no a couple times. I think, I think my fiancé has said, I think she might have said no twice to two other guys. Did that make you feel a little bit nervous? To ask? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Even though it's the kind of thing like you know, like you know what the answer is going to be until you actually like go to do it and then you're like, oh God, what if, yeah. And so you, you, you feel, you feel confident until you go to do it and then you're like, you're, you're not confident anymore, but. Especially since I have no to people before. Like, she has the guts to actually say no. Especially since what? She has the guts to actually say, like, no to people before. Yeah, they how were, say that? I think, maybe it was one or two, but they were not, like, they were not legit. Like, they were too early, oh. you know, <laughs> or something like that. So she was like, yeah, no, that's too early. Yeah. But no, you have to say no. If the answer is no, you have to. I don't want to marry the wrong person just because you feel bad. No, that's the worst. Think about Kim Kardashian. That's the worst. <laughs> I, I think she operates by a totally different set of rules than the average person. I don't think we can. We can't. We can't use. We can't use Kim Kardashian as a meter stick here. And don't even get me started on Kanye. Okay. So, enough about enough about my personal life. Life. Yes, let's review the anthro quiz. So, um, how did the anthro quiz go? Was it good, bad, okay? Good. Tough? Good. good? Okay. So, let's review it quickly. So, this first one I said your inner, your inner fish, Neil Shubin explained that primates have a number of adaptations. These adaptations indicate that our ancestors were adapted to living in the trees. What ad adaptation is that? Oh, yeah, I said the answer to it in the question. Mike, you have my paper. Maybe. Or you left it. It might, it might be upstairs. I'll go get it for you after. Um, right, so yeah, hands are, our hands with our grasping thumbs are adaptations to being in the trees, right? To grabbing onto those very thin branches. Of course, they were very useful later, right? We were able to carry things and manufacture tools and use tools but at first they weren't really for that they were for yeah they were for moving around in the trees um neil shubin said that as our vision improved what sense declined yeah our sense of our sense of smell right so again neil shubin said in the evolutionary world it, you kind of use it or lose it right if there's if there's an adaptation that isn't really helping an organism survive, it tends to kind of disappear, right? And so humans started using their eyes to find food, and so we just don't smell as well as our ancient primate ancestors did. Which is good because, you know, I don't know if I'd want to smell that many things, right? Um, ah, what, what, best characterizes the evolution of non-human primates? What's the kind of best statement here? Yeah, right? Exactly. So they've not evolved as effectively as humans? Well, no, that's not true, right? They're very effective in their own environments, right? They're very successful in their own environments. Um, they continue to become more human-like as they evolve in the modern world. That's not true either, right? 
The idea isn't, and this is, this is a common misconception because we're very e egotistical creatures, right? We think that we are the pinnacle of evolution, right? We're the best thing that's ever evolved. And so we assume that everything else is on a trajectory to become like us, right? But that's not true, right? I think we learned, I hope we learned during that chapter is that, you know, our evolution is kind of peculiar, right? And we've picked up a lot of adaptations that most animals don't have. And so the fact that we are the way we are is kind of a unique combination of historical events and natural selection. And, you know, in some ways it's kind of by accident we are the way we are. But not every form of life would evolve that way. And non-human primates aren't in the process of becoming like us. They're, be, they're evolving as their environmental pressures dictate, right? So again, they wouldn't, they wouldn't turn into us if we disappeared tomorrow, right? Um, so yeah, they're, they're evolving differently, but they're adapted to their, their own environments, right? Good. Um, Homo habilis, how did he acquire meat, or she? How did Homo habilis acquire meat? Yeah, they, they scavenged it, right? They weren't hunting their own food yet. They weren't really capable of doing that, but they were capable of collecting meat and brain tissue from animals that were already dead, right? which again is gross, but helpful to Homo habilis. Um, Southeast Asia, what primate did we find in Southeast Asia? What hominid, sorry. Erectus, yeah. Did people say other things for that one? I think you probably. Yeah, so, so Erectus is the one that first leaves Africa, moves itself into the Middle East, and then into Indian subcontinent, and then into Southeast Asia, right? So, so they're, they're found there. Um, Homo heidelbergensis is a common ancestor of whom? Yeah, Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis, right? Again, there's some, there's some recent dispute about this, but of course there's dispute about everything in paleoanthropology, so that might not be true, but they're working on it. But yeah, for our purposes, good. Um, the ability to make sounds common to us, to Homo sapiens, was made possible by the location of the? Yeah, hyoid bone, right? A little bone in here that kind of moves your larynx a little lower in your throat and allows you to make human sounds rather than monkey sounds, right? Although when, sometimes when we're tickled, we still make monkey sounds, but anyway. Um, some anthropologists believe Neanderthals were engaged in complex social and ritual behavior because of what? We have evidence of their... Yeah, deliberate burials. And I think some of you asked about the meaning to deliberate means on purpose, right? Not accidental, but on purpose. Um, what kind of tools was Homo erectus using? What kind of, what? Which one? B or C. B or C? Okay. B? We're looking at it in the slides, but I don't know which slide. Well, I'll give you a hint. Number one is totally made up. Oh, that's, not a, that's not a real thing. Yay! Yay! Okay. It is B, right? So Oldowan is, um, is associated with Homo habilis. I believe, it's, I believe Oldowan is, is associated with the first place they found these tools, which was in a place called Olduvai Gorge. So it comes from that. The Acheulean tools are was from Homo erectus, and they were first found at a place called St. Eshul, I believe. So that's why it's called like that. Um, 
Which of the following options represents a food that had a major effect on the evolution of the human brain? Red Bull. No, what? What? <laughs> yeah. It's it is. It's meat, right? It's meat. Um, the most important function of the first stone tools was. Nice. Nicely done. Yeah. Accessing a new source of food through scavenging. Two, our good friend Paranthropus Boisei, who had the really funny face. What did he do? C. C? Yeah, he had that the big. Uh, well, we don't know if he could have done that, but they had, they had big jaws, big teeth, big jaw muscles, good for chewing tough foods, right? Um, cooking food was advantageous to Homo erectus for all the following reasons except B. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. So there you go. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what? Homo erectus was not exchanging recipes with each other. They were not. Uh, okay, good. All right. Um, what's the answer to this one? This was a short answer one. Natural selection, right? That's the mechanism by which organisms with the best adaptations are selected either to survive or to pass on their genes. Those with adaptations that are not useful are selected out, right? They either die or they don't pass on their genes with enough frequency to survive, right? Good. Um, all modern or extinct bipedal primates, what do we call those? What is that? Hominids, Hominids. good. Some of you kind of struggled with that one, but actually I'm pretty sure a good half of you got it, which was very impressive. That's a, that can be a tough question. It's a bit of a minor detail, so that was good. Uh, Natharctus tenebrosus, why do we care about this creature? Yeah, they have, they have kind of, it's the first appearance of a hand that looks like our hand, right? That's very important. What else though? Why do we care about this creature? Yeah, this, this animal is presumed to be the common ancestor of all primates that ever existed, right? So, yeah, really good. Exactly, right? It's a, it's a common ancestor to all primates living about 50 million years ago or so. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, oh, that's weird. I don't know why it looks like that. But um, this was a trickier one, but at least two times in our evolutionary history, there's been a something version of hominids and another version existing at the same time. What was I talking about? Yeah, to use the fancy words, gracile and robust. Or if you said sort of a, a lightweight and a heavyweight version or a slimmer version and a thicker version or whatever you said, I think I would have been happy with any synonym you came up with. But that's what I was looking for, those two, two types, okay? Yeah, there we go. First homo species to live in northern Europe? I heard Neanderthal. Yeah. Ah, Homo heidelbergensis. Okay, so I have for this one. I think I accepted both. Um, originally, I said Neanderthalensis, but Homo heidelbergensis does find their way into Europe. Uh, in fact, the type specimen for that species comes from Germany. So I'll take both for that one. Neanderthals are kind of the. They're like the classic northern European hominid. People tend to think of them first, but it's kind of Heidelbergensis is probably there, probably there before them. So I'll take either one for that. And I did, I think. Ah, and in The Perfect Runner, Niobe Thompson said we have a bunch of adaptations to help us with our running. What was one of them? The Achilles tendon, right? So we have a tendon, a spring that goes right down the back of our calf. 
When we stretch our leg out, the spring loads. When we launch our foot off the ground, it contracts and gives us energy back into our stride, Shorter right? Shorter arms, longer legs. Shorter arms, longer legs. Good. What else? Arms increase. What's that? Arms oh, yeah, we have an arch in our foot, right? And that's a little, that's a spring as well, right? Does what else? That connects our head to our body to like the thing that connects our head to our bodies. Our neck, you mean? <laughs> yeah, but no, there's like a name for it. Nuchal ligaments? Yeah, there, there we go. Yeah, our nuchal ligaments, right? So comes down from the back of the head, connects to the shoulders, keeps your head in one place so it's not bouncing around all over the place. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, that'd, be very, that'd be very disorienting, right? Um, what else do we have? Big butts. Big butts. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Yeah, we have big butts. And what are those gluteus maximus muscles for? What, what are they useful for besides sitting on? Yeah. So when we, when we, when, yeah, when we're running, those muscles are flexing and keeping our upper body kind of upright, right? So they're very important. Um, what's his name? Daniel Lieberman in the film. He said, you know, you don't really use those muscles when you walk. Did anyone go home and try it? Did you walk around and grab your butt? No. no? Try it when you go home tonight, well, or whenever you want. Yeah, grab your butt and just walk around, and you'll see that it's not really, those muscles aren't doing anything. They're just sitting there. But if you start to run, that's when they start to work, right? They're, they're a running adaptation. They're not a walking adaptation. And really, none of these are, right? You can walk with... No Achilles tendon and flat feet and, you know, no nuchal ligament and you can walk around just fine. But it's when you run, these things start to happen. What else is there? Short toes. Short toes? Why are those good? Yeah, think of, think of a pencil, right? If you've got a long pencil, it's easy to break. If you've got a short one, pretty much impossible, right? What's that? I heard something. No? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ah, right. We are the sweatiest animals on the face of the planet, right? Gross. But we are, right? And what does that help us do? Fancy. Yeah, we can, we can cool, we can keep our bodies cool while we run, right? A very, well, just not a thing that other animals can do. They have to pant, and to do that, they actually have to stop moving, right? Or at least walk very slowly. And then they get killed. And then they get killed. Then yeah. yeah. Uh, anything else? Oh, yes. There is something else. Oh, the sure don't know. Yeah. Our... <laughs> don't be mean. Yeah, don't be mean. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, those are our shoulders, right? They're kind of low set and they're very loose. Right, and so they're connected to our nuchal ligament, and they help us to kind of balance and to keep our head in one place. Right, as soon as our head wants to sort of pitch forward, our arms are kind of pulling our head back into place. Right, again, you don't need any of these to walk, but you do need them in order to run. Okay, I think that. I think that's it. I think that's there's it. So many. There's so many. There's a few, yeah. I remember there's like so much. There's, there are quite a few, right? Uh, I think I have them upstairs in my office, so I'll run get them on the break, okay? Um, okay, so I think that's I think that covers I think that covers the quiz. So I'm gonna put that away and we'll switch back to where we were on Tuesday. So, we said around 12,000 years ago, some humans in some part of the world started to grow their own food, right? And so, this is what anthropologists call the agricultural revolution, okay? Huge cultural change for humans, probably the biggest one that we've ever been through, um, and maybe the most significant one as well, which is saying a lot for a species that now has smartphones and genetic technology and has been to the moon, right? 
it's quite a big thing to say that this is the biggest change we've been through. But it's huge, right? It's huge in terms of its effects in, on human cultural and social evolution, okay? So at different times, certain places in the world, people start to grow their own food. And we ask the question, well, why was that, right? If people were hunting and gathering for 340,000 years and successfully, why switch? Why change, right? Everything was going fine. And so we read this article on Jared Diamond, and he said that, well, the, the idea in the past was, of course, right? Of course humans switch to farming because farming was just easier, right? It was less work, you got more food, you could store that food, you had more free time. What's that? You could sleep more. Uh, it was great, right? Why wouldn't people switch to agriculture? And, and look, look at, you know, we all live off the fruits of agriculture. And when we go into the grocery store, oh, can you imagine a hunter-gatherer seeing that for the first time? They'd think they'd gone to heaven, right? Whole foods, whew, right? But... Despite all that, Jared Diamond says, yeah, but that's, that, theory doesn't, that, that theory doesn't really work, right? He rejects that theory, and he suggested his own idea. And what did he say? Yeah. They have switched to agriculture. Yeah. Humans have so many different, they affect diseases, like malnutrition, body, and so on more. Yeah. So these are the changes that are affected by the agriculture. Right. So we, we kind of made a distinction between our lives and the lives of early farmers, right? Because early farmers wouldn't have had access to all the foods that we have. They would have been probably focusing on one particular crop, right? And so if you were in the Middle East, it probably would have been wheat or millet. If you were in Southeast Asia, it probably would have been rice kind of depended where you were, but people focused on one particular food. And what you'll find, and you can do this today if you want, if you compare the nutrition in, say, fruits and vegetables, or nuts, or meats, or those kind of foods, and you compare it to wheat or rice, you'll see that there's not really a lot of nutrition in those grains. They have calories, right? They taste good, especially when you make them into bread and things like that, and pasta, oof, very tasty, right? But there's just not a lot, beyond calories, there's just not a lot in them, right? And often, if you look at flour or you look at rice, you'll see that the manufacturers have actually fortified them. They've actually added vitamins and minerals into them that actually aren't naturally occurring, but it's like, we feel like we want to make this more nutritious, so we're going to add some stuff in. But naturally, those things wouldn't have been there. And so people who spent a lot of their, or people who relied on wheat or rice or millet as most of their, most of their diet, yeah, they would have been getting calories, and they would have you know, been, had a full stomach, and they might have even enjoyed the taste of their bread or their rice or whatever. But it's not a super nutritious food, especially if you're eating that for a majority of your diet. And lots of these early farmers were. And so, as Jared Diamond pointed out, this switch to farming, he says, was a huge mistake. Right? And switching to that one crop and focusing on that one food had some pretty negative effects on our health, right? And so, he showed us that people's life expectancies declined, right? So comparing the skeletons of hunter-gatherers versus farmers in the same area, we found they didn't live as long as they used to. We found they didn't grow as tall as they used to, right? We found evidence of malnutrition, right? So this was the enamel hypoplasia, right? Where you could see these lines where the enamel stopped forming because these kids didn't have enough, this person when they were a child, they didn't have enough to eat, right? And again, 
This doesn't happen if you miss a meal, right? So <laughs> if you ever have kids one day and you know they don't want to eat their dinner and you send them to bed with no dinner, don't worry. <laughs> you're, you're, this is not going to happen. You have to go without food for some time for the body to like stop doing this. So this is a big deal, right? There's, there were times when this person as a child had barely any food to eat, right? We saw examples like this of iron deficiencies here um, uh, called parotid hyperostosis on the top of the cranium here, cribra orbitalia in the orbit of the eye. You can see the body trying to pull nutrients from the body structure itself because it's, it doesn't have enough coming in in the food, right? And we also said we saw evidence of disease, right? What's that? Yeah, this was evidence of tuberculosis. And there's, there's a few different diseases that you can see evidence on the bones themselves. Again, you have to be pretty seriously sick and you have to be sick for quite a long period of time. This won't happen over the weekend. <laughs> this was, this person was probably sick for months and months and months and, and if not a few years, right? So this is chronic disease going on that Again, you don't really see with hunter-gatherers. They don't live in very big numbers. They don't, they're not in contact with a lot of people. They don't have sanitation issues because they go off and poop in the woods and then they never go back there, right? So nothing gets into their water, right? There's no nasty bacteria or viruses or things. And so hunter-gatherers tend to be really, really healthy. And their bones, their bones look like that. And um, in my graduate work, when I was a grad student, um, we actually excavated the cemeteries of hunter-gatherers in Siberia. And so I can tell you, those people were in incredible health. Um, most of them were quite tall. The, some, the men, some of the men were basically as tall as I was, but definitely bigger boned. But, so they, they were bigger guys, bigger muscles. Um, Again, think of Olympic athletes out there because that's who you're that's who you're dealing with, right? Really strong, athletic, fit people, right? But again, some of our early farmers suffer a lot of health problems, malnutrition, tooth wear, cavities and tooth decay, um, tuberculosis and other diseases. And so yeah, health really really declined for these early farmers, right? And again, their farming experience is not really the same as ours. He said that farming allowed us to develop class divisions, okay? Um, and created, instead of an egalitarian or roughly equal social structure, it created a place where, or a situation where some people had more power than others and more access to resources. I'm gonna press pause on that one for a minute and we'll come back to it very shortly, okay? And the other thing Jared Diamond said is that it led to sexual inequality, okay? It led to men having more power than women. Now, do you have any idea about how that might have come about? How the switch to agriculture led to women kind of losing power in society? Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Sabrina, what were you going to say? Um, ah. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that comes a little bit later, but kudos for remembering that. Um, but yeah, I kind of I think you're I think you're correct there, right? In that women started to have more children because let me just see what my next slide is. Uh, okay, we'll come back to it in a sec. Um, yeah, women started to have more children as farmers, right? So again, you do need there is a lot of work to do when you're farming. Um, contrary to the progressivists who said, oh, farming is so easy. It's not so easy. <laughs> it's actually a lot of work, especially when you have no machines to rely on and you have to do all the work yourself. 
There's no such thing as irrigation systems, right? Water has to be carried to the fields to water your crops. Farming's a lot of work, right? And so the easiest way to get that work done is to have a little army of children, and then you can send them out into the fields and they can help you with your farm, right? And so women start having more children, right? But hunter-gatherer, for hunter-gatherer mothers or for hunter-gatherer women, that's a bad idea, right? Because think about these people move all the time, right? 10 or 15 kilometers a day on average. You can't have a bunch of small kids and do that, right? You, you, you've probably all seen like people, you know, mothers probably in Walmart with three kids and like, you know, one kid they're holding and the other kid is like dragging them around and the third kid is having a meltdown in the aisle and screaming and crying and she's trying to push the basket at the same time. Like, you can barely get around Walmart, right? Never mind walking 15 kilometers through the, through the wilderness, right? So hunter-gatherer mothers tend to be very careful about their birth spacing, right? So one of the ways in which they do this is that they actually nurse their children for a long time, okay? So they breastfeed their children. Some, yeah, sometimes even for a little bit longer than that. And again, what that does is when a woman is breastfeeding, her kind of hormonal state is such that it's less likely that she will get pregnant again. Not foolproof, right? But less likely, right? The, the woman's body thinks, okay, we're still caring for an infant. Let's not, let's not create another one just yet, right? And so, yeah, what you'll see is that hunter-gatherer women tend to have longer birth spacing, maybe one every four years or so, right? Whereas farming women tend to have more babies, right? And if you have more babies, then you wind up kind of stuck in the house, right? You're either pregnant all the time or you're caring for small children, you know, making them meals, and you don't really have the ability to participate in the farming, right, in the production of the food. Whereas with foragers, women are actually very important in foraging for food. And in fact, they're the ones that will more reliably feed the group, right? Because men go out hunting, sometimes they don't get any animals, right? You shoot your arrow and you miss, come home with nothing. But the women are more successful usually in getting roots and berries and nuts and seeds, things like that. And so they're the ones who are gonna feed the group all the time. But again, as they kind of, as they become kind of excluded from producing food, they kind of start to lose their power a little bit. They get to lose, they start to lose their say and they become kind of more stuck in the home dealing with the children, right? Which again, is probably a very traditional arrangement that we're still familiar with, right? Again, connected to agriculture. So the question is this. The question is, if this was so bad, right? Jared Diamond is saying this is the biggest mistake we've ever made. If it's so bad, why did people, why did people switch to agriculture anyway? If it was such a bad idea. What? Easier. It's easier? Maybe they didn't adapt to this environment agriculture. That's what... Like they got used to it? Yeah. Okay. So it's true, after a while they definitely would have gotten used to it. Sabrina, you said that it's easier, um, but that's kind of, um, and maybe Jared Diamond didn't do a very good job of explaining that, but as it turns out, it's really not. <laughs> but isn't it like in terms of like stock of food, whereas you were like hunting and they kind of didn't want to like say it's more like you know, Right. Well, it's, you know, the thing about farming is that there's, there's definitely work to be done every day, right? And so you've got to pull the weeds, you've got to, you know, build your fences to make sure animals don't get in and eat your crop. You've got to sort of make sure every, all the plants are happy. You've got to water the crops, right? And again, for most places, there, there's no such thing as irrigation, right? Hoses don't get invented for thousands of years later, right? And so the only way you get water into the fields usually is by filling buckets, 
and walking into the field and watering, right? So they started earning, the, earning money from the agriculture. They started earning money from it? Yeah. Um, eventually they do, but money is another thing that comes quite a bit later. So money doesn't get invented yet. But you're right, they could have been used to it. It actually winds up being a lot of work. Sorry, but it is. <laughs> um, why else might they, why would they have either turned to agriculture or stuck with it, even though it seems to have been a bad choice? In the article, we argue that it's just the people who are Ah, interesting. He talks about population growth, right? That's an important, that's an important point, especially since here on Earth, our population is still growing very, very rapidly, right? But the same issue was present in the past, thousands of years ago. Again, our populations weren't going like this at the time, but they were, they were actually growing. And so, yeah, we do have, we do have the concept of population growth. But we also have the concept of carrying capacity. Does anyone know what that is, carrying capacity? Maybe from bio? Maybe? Maybe more about the important environment. Environment can sustain. Yeah. Good. From biology? Nice. Nicely done. Yeah, very true. So the carrying capacity is the amount of in this case humans, but it could be animals too, the amount of humans that nature can sustain on her own, right? So if we're hunting and gathering, we probably know that nature only provides so much food, right? There's only so many rabbits out there, there's only so many mushrooms, there's only so many berries, right? And so as long as you, I'm gonna draw on the board, So as long as you stay below the carrying capacity, so if the carrying capacity is here, as long as your population doesn't go past that amount, you're good, right? You can always, you can always find the food that you need. The closer you get to that line, of course, the more difficult it's gonna to be to find food, right? And so again, hunter-gatherers are gonna do their best to keep their populations low, right? They're gonna space out their births, because they don't want to go over that, that line. Because if you go over it, if your populations go over it, now you're in a place where there's not enough food for everybody, right? And then you're going to start to go hungry, right? You're going to start to starve. And Jared Diamond is kind of saying, well, that's what eventually happens to people. They try to keep their population levels low, but slowly they creep up, right? And eventually you get to a place where you're not really over it yet. But you're kind of getting you're kind of getting close. Right? You're starting to find that the food that was very easy to find decades or hundreds of years ago now is kind of more difficult. Right? It's more difficult to find. And eventually you kind of get to a point where you have to do something about it, right? And you can either start to starve or you can kind of put some energy into the environment to help it along, right? And um, yeah, so we talked about that. So probably what happened is very kind of simple interventions that people made, right? So maybe they would burn down sections of forest, right? If you burn down a section of forest, you get a bunch of new growth, new plants, new animals, that probably would have helped to rejuvenate the environment a little bit quicker sometimes, right? You might have found people deciding that, well, you know, wheat grows really well here, so let's take the seeds and just throw them around, right? And next time we come through this area, there'll be more, right? You just kind of help Mother Nature along a little bit, right? Maybe if you're here on the West Coast, maybe you know there's a bunch of clams at this, you know, buried in this point of the shoreline, but you know there's not really any over there. So maybe you collect a bunch of them, put them over there, and then they'll start to reproduce. And so next time you go, there'll be clams in both areas, right? 
Maybe you have a stream that doesn't have as many fish, and so you start to you know, transplant some fish from one stream to the other to get them. So you just kind of help nature along, right? But the idea here is that as you continue to do this, you get, you're sort of pushing the carrying capacity up a little bit, right? But as you're doing that, your population is still growing, right? It's still coming up. And so you've got to keep pushing the, the carrying capacity up further. And eventually that's going to end in people spending a lot of time cultivating fields, right? Setting up fields, building fences to keep animals out, weeding, watering. They're going to spend less time moving around and hunting and foraging, more time taking care of their fields. And eventually they're going to settle down right beside them and build a house and that's where they're going to stay, right? But keep in mind, this isn't, this isn't a quick process. This isn't an overnight process. This isn't, you know, okay guys, tomorrow farming, right? It's not like that. It probably took generations and generations, right? People started making little adjustments, right? Little ways of helping mother nature along and then slowly devoting more time and more energy to growing food. And then finally winding up having to invest in that field all the time, right? Their population numbers are too high, right? And they have to stay there. And that's, I'm just gonna jump ahead here. And that's what people refer to as the agricultural trap, okay? So this kind of happens probably for generations, right? People invest more in their fields, but eventually, like I say, you're gonna get to a point where So that's the carrying capacity for hunting and gathering, right? And so eventually you're, you're going to go over that, right? And so you push the carrying capacity of the land up, right? You push the carrying capacity of the land up so it produces more because you're planting food and you're weeding and you're watering it and all that stuff. But even if your population grows to this point, right? Let's say you're there, and then you decide, you know what? This farming thing, what a bust, right? This was a huge mistake. Our health has suffered. We've got class divisions and gender divisions, and what a disaster this has been. Let's go back to hunting and gathering people. Can they do that? No, right? Because there's just not enough food to do that, right? Imagine if everyone in Vancouver tomorrow decided, okay, no more food stores, no more Tim Hortons. We're all going to hunt and gather. How long do you think it would take before we had stripped this city of every edible substance? It's probably 800,000 people in Vancouver. Do you think there's 800,000 people worth of food here? No, right? People would eat every crow, every seagull, every nut or blade of grass or anything they could eat. And then in a week, we'd be out of food, right? Because there's just not enough here to support that number of people. And it would have been the same thing for farmers, right? As they continue to invest more and more, their populations continue to rise. And eventually, they get to the point where they really can't go back. Right? Because there just won't be enough food to feed their numbers. And it's definitely the same today, right? With 7.6 billion people, there's no way we could go back to hunting and gathering. There's just not enough natural food for us all. We have to put more energy into the land in order to get the food that we need. Right? And so, again, even though you know, and I don't know if you believe Jared Diamond or if, he, if it was a big mistake or not, but even if you decided that it was a big mistake, it's just not something we can go back to, right? Because there's just too, too many of us, right? And so we kind of become stuck with agriculture, whether we like it or not. 
<sighs> Okie dokie. Uh, would you like to take a little break? Yeah. yeah, me too. Okay, let's take a break and and then we'll come back.
All right. So <clears throat> what we're talking about here when we talk about the first farmers is we're talking about what we would normally call simple farming or Sweden farming or um, Sweden agriculture or simple agriculture or horticulture or there's all kinds of different names, okay? But basically what it isn't, what it isn't is intensive agriculture, which we'll get to in a minute, okay? So here we're talking about the first farmers as people who are farming, but using very kind of simple tools and simple methods, okay? Um, another part of what they're doing, and this is, this is the Sweden part, um, the other important part is that they're using fire as a farming tool, okay? And so what they're doing, and this is a very useful thing to do, but what they're doing is taking a section of forest, let's say, and basically burning it down to the ground, okay? Every tree, every blade of grass, everything is burnt. And in doing so, you create a soil that is very... It recovers the nutrients. Yeah. It's got tons of nutrients and it's very fertile, ashes. right? And what? Ashes. Yeah. It's very fertile from the ashes. And so you plant your crop in there and you get a really good harvest, right? First year, second year, for a while, right? But eventually what's going to happen is that the harvest, the yield is going to start to decline. And at that time, what these people will do is just move their field to another area, burn it down again, and start to grow their food there, right? And so they use this kind of, this kind of tactic of burning something down, planting their crop, and actually getting a really good harvest out of it. But again, it's only useful for a few years. Then your soil starts to run out of nutrients and you've got to move to another plot, okay? Um, yeah, so here's a guy doing some Sweden agriculture, burning down some forest in order to create a field. Here's some people using some very simple tools with which to farm. Again, this is a very simple farming with, you know, no real fertilizers, no pesticides, no irrigation technology. It's kind of very simple gardens, right? Like, like people might keep in their backyard sort of thing. I didn't go get it. Shoot. Um, I didn't go get your, your quiz. Um, like we said, people, people who were farming in this kind of early period would have probably been focusing on one crop, sometimes maize, mostly here in North and South America, or rice, or wheat, or sorghum, or barley, um, depending on where in the world you are. We probably would have found that these early farmers were also not really producing a huge surplus, right? So they might, they'll grow enough food for themselves, maybe a little extra just in case if they can, but that's kind of it, right? They're basically farming year to year and they're living in villages where basically everyone is a farmer, right? Everyone is responsible for growing their own food, okay? So again, these people are still practicing a reasonably simple subsistence strategy and they're living in a very kind of simple social political group, right? Because everyone's a farmer, everyone's looking after their own plots, right? Their own fields. Um, of course, people practicing simple agriculture are living in greater population densities, right? So they're actually, little villages actually exist for maybe the first time ever. But, ah, um, we still see a division of labor. So with hunter and gatherers, we saw that the men were generally out hunting, the women were out gathering. And here we see still a division of labor where men are doing more of the farming work. Women are kind of starting to be confined to the household and the raising of children. But of course, children are very useful you know, to employ in farming as well. They're free labor, right? So you can, you can use them uh, to, to run your farm. Um, but again, we're starting to see a more elaborate social structure, right? You have a bunch of people who are living together in large numbers, and that requires some coordination, right? It requires some kind of agreement as to what the rules are, right? It's, it, it requires some kind of 
maybe person to mediate disputes, right? Sabrina lives next door to me and she thinks the property line is here and I think the property line is here. Well, Sabrina and I could probably like kill each other and try to figure out who's right. Or maybe we need someone to help us mediate disputes, right? To decide whose land is where. The other interesting thing that comes out of this period is the idea of kind of land ownership. Okay? That's something that hunter-gatherers just don't, just don't have, right? Hunter-gatherers share everything. Uh, and so, you know, here, of course, this is my phone, right? You can't have it. If you steal it, the police will catch you and take you to jail. No, but you know what I mean, right? This is, this is actually mine. But hunter-gatherers don't really have an idea of mine and yours. There's just things, right? You can't really own things. And you definitely can't own the land, right? The land is something that you belong to, right? It's something that takes care of you. It's like your mother, right? Can you own your mother? You can? Oh, God. I was going to say, what kind of family do you come from? But no, you, you can't really own your mother, right? That's a weird, that's a weird thing to say, right? And for hunter-gatherers, owning land is like that. That's a weird thing to say, right? You can, you can just draw a little box, and you can say that this belongs to me, and you can't touch it. It's very strange, right? Um, well, yeah, right? So later on, we'll get to that. But that's where nobility comes from, right? Yeah. They're the ones that own the land, and there are people that work on the land, right? So, yeah, and, and that's what Jared Diamond is talking about, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, yeah, so there's more people living in one place. There's more kind of social organization that's happening. Um, but it's still a pretty simple, it's a pretty simple subsistence strategy and a simple way to live. But eventually what's going to happen is our same problem is over on the board. Right? So instead of, instead of hunting and gathering, we're going to have farming down here. Right? And so as people continue to farm, their populations continue to grow. But now they're growing a lot faster. Right? Because hunter-gatherer mothers were trying to only have a child every four years or so. Right? And even if they did, even if they did have a child every four years, keep in mind infant mortality is quite high, right? So they may wait four years to have a child and then their child might not make it. They might die in childbirth or they might die when they're very young. And then they'll tr maybe try to have another one. And so, but here, you know, farming, farming families are like seven, eight, nine kids, right? And so now all of a sudden, populations are starting to go woo, right? So we're not seeing a gradual, we're not seeing a gradual thing, we're starting to see it go up like this, right? And so eventually again, people are gonna get to a place where the land is not enough, right? Because that field that you burnt down and you farmed from, and then it kind of wasn't producing the way it used to, and then you moved, that first field is gonna require maybe 20 years or so to regrow, right? So that you can burn it down again. And so this works really well if you don't have a lot of people and you have a lot of land that you can move to. But as your population starts getting higher, you're gonna start running out of space. You're gonna start running out of land. You're gonna to have to use that first field. You can't wait 25 years, right? Maybe you can only wait 10. And then eventually, maybe you can only wait eight. And suddenly, your rotation of fields gets shorter and shorter. And eventually, you have to actually start using that field maybe every couple of years, or every maybe even every year. So again, you're going to run up against the carrying capacity of the land at simple agriculture. Right? There's just not enough food anymore to feed everyone. You're going to have to put more energy in. You're going to have to do something different. And so that's where people start to switch to intensive agriculture. Okay? And this is agriculture where people are farming the same field basically every year. 
and they're using technology to help them increase their yields, okay? Um, so yeah, intensive agriculture. To give you an example of this, I'd like to use Egypt. A, because I think it's cool, but B, because it's one of the first areas in the world to start to switch to agriculture. And let me just see if I have a couple of pretty pictures. I think Egypt is beautiful. I'd love to go one day. Um, Egypt, as you might know, um, historically and currently is based around the Nile River, right? And the Nile runs from kind of East Central Africa all the way through um, Egypt. And it's kind of the reason that Egypt exists, right? So if you look at a satellite picture of Egypt, you will see that there's not really much out there, right, beyond the river valley. The river valley is what keeps um, that part of the land fertile. Um, but the rest is just desert, right? Sand, rocks, scorpions, jackals. There's nothing out there, right? And as it turned out, Egypt um, about, oh gosh, I guess it was about 12,000 years ago. Um, what started to happen in Egypt was climate change, right? Parts of Egypt started to get warmer and drier than they used to be. And so people who used to be farming out here, right, and living simple farming out here, suddenly their farms started to dry up, right? The rain stopped coming. And so they were forced to move closer to the river in order to keep farming. And so you not only had population growth going up, but you had people getting pushed next to the river. And soon everybody lived next to the river because there was really nowhere else to go, right? And so they had very little land, they had a lot of people, and they had to switch their subsistence strategy to something more advanced, something that could produce more food, right? And intensive agriculture, intensive agriculture did that for them. So the ancient Egyptians were growing a number of different crops. They were, uh, they were growing wheat and barley and flax. All of those crops like the kind of warm, dry weather. They really like that. Um, but people also practiced horticulture as well, right? So the other thing that's happening here is that there are people, you know, using little elements of diff different subsistence strategies, right? People are practicing intensive agriculture, but in their backyard, they're, you know, growing fruits and vegetables in their little backyard plot. And there's people keeping animals as well, which we'll get to. So there's a few different things happening at the same time, but we also see some new technologies, okay? So here, uh, this is from the wall of a tomb in ancient Egypt. I'm not sure whose tomb, but you can see in a very important new piece of technology. What is it? They use what? Animals, yeah, what? Hmm. That is correct. That's not what this picture is showing, but it's but irrigation is important for sure. But you can see that they've got they're using these animals, yeah, and they've got a plow out back, right? So there's a big wooden plow to create a furrow to plant seeds in. He's got it hooked up to his oxen. He's got a little whip. The oxen get lazy, he can just urge them on. And even though this was kind of the, the set of tools that farmers might use thousands of years ago. There's still some people in Egypt practicing this sort of very traditional form of intensive agriculture today, right? But 10,000 years ago, that was the height of technology, right? The, the plow was useful for cutting a furrow, turning over the soil, and planting seeds, right? But again, like you mentioned, probably the most important aspect of what's going on here is irrigation, right? Because if you know anything about Egypt, you'll know that it is super hot and super dry, and you need a way to water your crops. You need a way to irrigate them. And so you can't depend on the rain because it never comes. And so the Egyptians had to find a way to get water to their crops. And they did it by creating a system of 
canals and irrigation ditches. Okay? And so the idea was is that if the river was flowing here, you would create a system of canals and sort of shallower dikes here that would allow the water to flow in, and then you could seal it off. Right? And so Egypt was, was very fortunate. Okay. Um, often when we think, sorry, I've got a few different tangents in my head at the same time. Egypt was very fortunate because, you know, we think of ancient Egypt and we think of, you know, pyramids and gold and treasures and things like that. And certainly they had all of those things. They had a lot of minerals. They had a lot of gemstones. They had a lot of good building stones. So they were very rich in natural resources. But really what they had that made all the difference for them was the Nile itself. And it wasn't just the water that they needed, but the Nile would flood every year. Okay, And so when the rains came in Central Africa, all of that rainwater would pour down the Nile all the way through, and it would basically flood the fields of Egypt. Okay, And what would happen is when the water came back down, it would leave a nice layer of kind of very thick, silty, organic mud, right? All kinds of like decaying plant matter and animal matter and stuff that's mixed into the river got deposited on the fields, right? And it was an excellent, excellent fertilizer, right? So every year, the Egyptians got a new layer of fertilizer put on their fields just by nature. Right? And so they had the river flooding, putting fertile soil back on their fields. But they also figured out a way to dig these canals, fill them with water, and then close them off on the ends so that the water would stay there and they could continue to water their crops from the canals and from these dikes beside them. And so it's a very clever technology a very difficult thing to build, right? You really have to be able to survey. You need to know your angles, right? And how high the water is going to come so you can get the water to flow in properly. Can you imagine building all this and having the angles wrong so the water just doesn't come in? Oof, embarrassing, right? Um, so they built these things. And again, I don't have any really good photos of it because it's these things are kind of lost to the desert, desert sands. But here's a, an artist's rendition. And you can see kind of all the important things that are happening, right? You've got these big fields that people are growing a single crop in. People are all cooperating now, right? It's not just your farm and my farm, but people are working together. We see these dikes that are meant to help irrigate the crops. You see lots of storage containers or granaries over there, which are very helpful. I've got another one here. It's pretty cartoony, but it, <clears throat> but it gives you the idea. There's a guy with a plow, right? Brand new technology. Got a couple of oxen there. You can see some people making some, um, some clay bowls, which we'll see there, or which we'll talk about in a second. So. Sorry. This is all very kind of new, new technology, right? And a new way of a new way of farming. A much more complicated way of farming, right? There's much more to deal with here in terms of making sure the fields flood properly, making sure they're fertilized, figuring out where the fields are after the flood because everything gets covered, creating these canals and dikes. And then of course, once the canals are planned. They have to be built. And once they're built, they have to be maintained and cleaned out. Right? There's a lot of extra work going into this. But it allows the, the Egyptians to be very successful in their farming. And in fact, in ancient times, they could actually get two crops per year out of their field. Two harvests per year, which is, what's that? Uh, a lot of it would have been, yeah. Uh, I don't know that rice grows very well in Egypt. I think, I think rice likes it wet. And so, yeah, I think you would have to find a wetter climate for that. But wheat, barley, millet, flax, uh, you 
maybe sorghum. I'm not really sure. Probably a few different crops that they would have they would have grown. Um, yeah, and so this kind of happens around the world in different places, in China, in Mesopotamia, in India, and these are kind of the first civilizations, okay? The first cultures that kind of grow up on intensive agriculture, and as a result, they become very sophisticated. They become, they have social stratification, right? There's different layers of society. Some people have lots of money and power, right, and opportunity. People at the bottom have maybe less or none at all, right? And so intensive agriculture is the basis for the basis for these civilizations, okay? The basis for this more complex form of living. And here's here's kind of how it works. Okay? Here's how it works. Yeah, let me lead you through this. So at the top left there is intensive agriculture, right? People are kind of forced to turn to it eventually because they're getting close to surpassing the carrying capacity of the land just with simple farming. They need to do something to produce more food, and so they do. In many places, like in Mesopotamia and particularly in Egypt, that leads to a food surplus, okay? Suddenly, they can grow two crops a year next to the river, right? That's a huge amount of food. And in fact, it's more food that a family can use, right? And so what that means is that when people were simple farmers, everyone was a farmer, right? Everyone was working on their own field so they could feed their family. But all of a sudden, with intensive agriculture, my farm doesn't just feed my family, but it'll actually feed five or six other families as well, right? And that's pretty useful because now those five or six other families don't have to farm, right? They are free to do other things, right? And what can they do? Well, they can specialize in other crafts, right? They can build pottery for people. They can build wagons. They can raise chickens or oxen or build plows or make clothing or make beautiful jewelry or learn how to read and write so they can have a job in the palace, right? They can work for the government as a tax collector. We'll get to that later. But suddenly people are free to do these other things because they don't have to farm anymore, right? And of course, that's where we are today. Only only a few of us are farmers today. What do you think, <clears throat> here in Canada, what do you think the percentage is? How many, how many Canadians do you think are farmers, percent-wise? 5%? 23? 40-something? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. What What did you guys think? Fifteen. Ooh, interesting. Um, the last I checked, it was about one point two percent. It's probably lower now. Um, so yeah, here in Canada, of course, we do have farms, but not many of us are farmers, right? We all make our living in different ways, and that kind of starts here with intensive agriculture. Not everybody has to be a farmer, and so they're free to do other things, right? And they can trade whatever they produce for the agricultural produce that they need. Yeah. But another thing is happening, okay? Another thing is happening. We said that people need to build canals and dikes, right? We said that people need to build canals and dikes. And I said that this wasn't actually easy to do, right? It actually took some expertise. You had to be good at math. You had to survey and lay out where the, where the canals would go. You had to figure out all the angles. Then you had to build these things. And building them was a community project, right? Everyone had to pitch in. And then once they were built, 
they would require everyone to pitch in to keep them functional, right? At the end of the season, you'd have to go in and dig out all the mud, right? So they don't get all filled out. Any sticks or things that were jammed in there, broken stones or whatever had to be replaced. So there was a lot of upkeep. There was a lot of maintenance that had to happen as well. And it was important because everybody's farm, everybody's food depended on the canals. And so what did you need? Well, you needed a group of people who were in charge of the canals, right? People who were in charge of surveying and building and cleaning and maintaining and making sure that everybody did their part, right? If you're going to use the canal, you have to do your part to keep it clean and functional, right? You don't get to use it for nothing. And what is that? Well, it's almost like a tax, right? You have to kind of pay to use the canal. And you also have to pay people to kind of build them and run them and make sure that they're always functional, right? And so people start to give a little bit of their harvest to these people who are designing and looking after the canals, right? And soon before you know it, people are not only kind of controlling the canals, but they're also predicting the floods, right? How high will the flood come this year? Will it be a good, a good agriculture season or a bad one? And the people who can predict those floods the best in terms of their timing and their amount, those people are going to claim that the gods told them, right? The gods told me that the floods would come and they would be good this year. And if you're right, it almost seems like you have divine blessing, right? The gods are whispering in your ear. And so those people start to gain power, right? And prestige. And they start to live off of the people who pay them with the harvest. Maybe you pay them a little extra harvest in order to hopefully get a better, a better harvest, a better flood, right? If the gods are talking to you, maybe you can put in a good word and get them to bless me, right? And so this administration slowly starts to build into some kind of a state government, right? Usually with a king of some kind. In Egypt, of course, it was a pharaoh, although pharaoh is a later term, but some kind of king would come out of this. And then you have the beginnings of a kingdom, right? Of a real state. But then you also need these other things too, right? You have a ruler, somebody who's kind of blessed by the gods, but then you also need bureaucrats, right? Because people are gonna start to pay taxes and we need to figure out, well, how much land do these people have? And what's their harvest going to be? And what do they owe the king in taxes? And did they pay last year and how much? Right? Suddenly, suddenly we have a group of people who need to know how to read and write. And so this is the development of writing. Sorry, I would like to tell you that it's because of love poetry or something like that, but it's not that. It's accounting. What a letdown. But that's where writing starts to come from, is people need to keep track of administrative activities. They need to keep track of taxes. And so the first writing comes out of this. And in fact, the very first writing and the very first alphabet is only good for accounting purposes. You can't actually write a story in it. It's not complete that way. But later alphabets will be. And then, of course, eventually you're going to have to organize armies. You're going to have to have military commanders. Because now that we've built all this, we don't want the people over the hill riding in and taking it all from us, right? So we need to defend ourselves, right? We need some sort of plan and organization to protect us from outsiders, right? And so suddenly, just because you've got this intensive agriculture and a food surplus, now you can have all of this complexity developing, right? You've got people specializing in different crafts, going to a market and exchanging the things that they produce for the things that they need. You've got all kinds of different people in society. You've got an administration, eventually maybe a king, and a bunch of bureaucrats and probably priests and generals, all of them 
living off the taxes that the farmers pay. And now you've got kind of a very complicated society, right? You used to have all hunter-gatherers, then you had all farmers. Now you have all kinds of different people doing all kinds of different jobs, right? And these kind of societies that kind of show up in this part, these parts of the world, um, you know, around five and a half to 6,000 years ago, these are, these are civilizations, right? Really complex forms of social cooperation that we've really never seen before up to this point, okay? All right, I'm gonna press pause there because I have one thing to remind you of and one thing to tell you about, okay? So the first thing I'll remind you about, or the thing I'll remind you about, of course, is the um, midterm on Tuesday. Okay, uh, it'll cover chapters one, one, two, three, and five. I think I said one. Uh, there is a chapter four in the book, but we haven't done it, and I don't think you will. So yeah, skip over chapter four in the book, unless you're really interested, in which case go ahead. Um, we'll do that. We'll start immediately at two o'clock on Tuesday, and I'll give you. You can have the whole class to write, but when you're done, you can just hand it in to me and go. So if you're done in an hour, hand it in and go. If you want to take more time, you'll have that time, okay? Now, the second thing I need to tell you is um, potentially bad news, but maybe it's good news. I, I don't know. Um, but I can't continue to teach this course this term. Well, here's why. Um, Across the street, we have a, a high school program, which you're familiar with. Um, no, no. Um, we have a high school program, and the principal, the head of that program, is going on maternity leave. So she's pregnant. Sarah? Sarah's pregnant. Oh, wow. You didn't know that. No, I didn't. I haven't seen her in like a year. Okay. Anymore. That's not your fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> so it's definitely not my fault. So, so Sarah, so Sarah's going to go, Sarah's going to have her baby in kind of late April. So she's going to go on maternity leave for a year and someone has to replace her. And so that's going to be me. So in another month or so, I'm head of secondary across the street. Yay. Yay. But no. But also no. no. But also no. So I didn't think that... I knew the job was coming up, and I didn't think that I would have to give up my classes, but it seems that I kind of do. Um, and so that's kind of unfortunate. Um, Why don't we go online then? Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 it's not, I, I, it's not, it's not a, I'll be here every day. It's not a physical presence. It's a time thing. But I can't learn when I don't know. You don't know that. I know that. The reason why I picked this class is because yeah. of you. I know, I know, and that's why I feel bad. And and I, to be honest with you, um, I really thought long and hard about taking that job. I didn't take it like that. I actually thought about it for over a week. Uh, and one of one of the reasons why I struggled is because I didn't. I really don't like. I really don't like giving up classes at all. And I I don't even like taking a half a class. Like I. I think if you start it, you should finish it. Um, but in this case, I, I can't, okay? And so what's going to happen is that we're gonna have our midterm on Tuesday. Um, and then I will, I'll, I'll mark that and I'll calculate a grade and- A for everyone. A for everyone, no, <laughs> I hope. Um, and then for the next few weeks or until the end of the course, um, a guy named Cornell is going to come in here and teach the rest of it. And Cornell teaches here, he teaches Anthro 110 all the time. And so he's going to finish out the term for me. Okay? So Cor Cornell and I are still Cornell and I are still figuring out how we're going to do the grade thing to are make it friends? fair for you guys. Uh, no, yeah. Like real friends? Like is he like no, we're not like we don't hang out on the weekends together. But he, he's a nice guy, we get along well. Um, and so 
so we'll come in on Friday and we'll talk about how the grading will work for the rest of the course, just so that you are, just so that you know what's going on. But also the point is, is that even though we're kind of making a switch halfway, we, we don't want you to be disadvantaged, okay? And so we're gonna try and talk about that and figure out how to do it, okay? Um, so again, if you, if you don't like me and you're tired of hearing me talk, then you're welcome. <laughs> but if you are disappointed, like I, I honestly do, I honestly do apologize to you because I do not like to, I, I don't really like to do this. And I, I almost, I almost said no because of it. I almost said no because of it. Shut up. You didn't. I know, but That's I, what but I didn't, but I didn't. You're right. So now we're going to fail. So now you are not going to fail. You're going to be fail. just fine. We're going to be right. So, so that's what's happening next week. Um, we'll do the midterm, and then Cornell will start with you on Friday, but I'll come at the beginning of class just to kind of say my tearful goodbye to so you. next week you're not going to teach us anymore? No, I'm not going to teach you anymore. <gasps> but, so, one more second, one more second. I'm going to let you go in one minute. Just give me one more minute here. Um, give me one more minute. So that that's what'll happen next week. Um, again, I, you know, if you are disappointed, I apologize to you, and I didn't, I didn't make the decision lightly. And again, I, I came very close to saying no because I didn't want to give up my classes, and I don't like doing it. Yeah. Am I at least gonna get paid more? Um, it's about the same. Oh, it's, not worth it. it's about the same. Well, I, <laughs> I that occurred to me too, but it'll probably be a good experience for me. Yes, I probably will miss you, but I won't. But I won't quit and come back here. But you can come and visit me over there if you want, because I'm right across the street. Or maybe I'll come visit you guys because I know. I know where you have class. <laughs> but anyway, that's what's happening. So again, we're, Cornell and I are going to make sure that you guys aren't at a disadvantage because of this. But yeah, but I, I'm sorry to leave you halfway through. I don't really, I don't like doing that, but that's, that's how it is. It is unfortunate. I agree with you. OK. That is all I have, so you can pack it up, and I hope you have a good weekend, and I'll see you on Tuesday, okay? Study hard. Study hard. <laughs>